Hello everyone, my name is Halvi. In this video, I'll be explaining the lore behind the bosses of Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. Pugo is the leader of a group of bandits. He aims to steal whatever he can from the people of Dayan's capital city. The Benyon Occupation Army pays them no mind, and so it is up to Micaiah and the Dawn Brigade to stop him. Isaiah is a captain in Benyon's Occupation Army. He corners Micaiah and the Dawn Brigade in a back alleyway. He plans to be the one to take down the Dawn Brigade so he can rise higher in Benyon's ranks. Zaiten is a captain in the occupation army. He was stationed at the manor of Lord Kiska. He and his soldiers guard many valuables they've stolen from rare objects to necessary supplies. Burton is a captain in the Occupation Army. He is stationed at the Glaive prison camp, and so when Soth breaks in to free Micaiah, Burton leads his troops in an effort to prevent their escape. Pain and Agony are the leaders of a group of Beast Lagoos bandits. They have claimed a treasure-filled ruin in the Desert of Death as their territory. They believe Micaiah and the Dawn Brigade to be trespassing and attack them. They also seem to see Bjork as food. Wiston is a captain in the Occupation Army. He is attacking Pelis' hideout when Micaiah arrives and helps to fight back against Benyon's forces. Laverton is a captain in the Occupation Army. He and his troops are in control of the Murado territory in Dayan. He is willing to kill hostages to force his foes to surrender. Tejur is a captain in the Occupation Army. He oversees operations at the Umono prison camp, one of the largest work camps where former Dayan soldiers are being held prisoner. Micaiah and the Liberation Army come here to free the soldiers and add them to their ranks. Radman is a captain in the Occupation Army. He executes civilians in the Shifu Swamp to lure Micaiah and the Dayan Liberation Army into a trap. Jared is the general of Benyon's occupation army in Dayan serving under the senator Numida. He gathered all Dayan men of fighting age and put them to work in labor camps. Their work was brutal and designed to break both body and spirits, destroying any hope they had of fighting back. He also fortified his army with weapons and supplies, bought with stolen funds from Dayan. He purchased mercenaries using those same stolen funds. He constantly sends his men to hunt down Micaiah and the Dawn Brigade. He is a noble from a minor house and rose to his position through his own skill. Sonaki soon found out about what Jared and Numita had been up to and so she formed up an inspection team to confirm what she had heard. Jared and Numita realized they need to finish off Micaiah and the Liberation Army as soon as possible. However, all of their attempts fail. Numita then betrays Jared, placing all of the blame on him and appealing to Sonaki that all was done without his knowledge. Upon realizing that he has been betrayed and was seemingly no way out, Jared resolved to at least take down Micaiah with him as revenge for driving him to this point. Jared tries to ambush Micaiah at night but is stopped by the Black Knight. Jared's Lieutenant Alder takes a blow from the Black Knight and sacrifices his life for Jared's. Jared then holds himself up in Day and Keep for one last chance at revenge on Micaiah. He is foiled once again and defeated by Micaiah's Liberation Army. Zephyrin is a captain of the Imperial Draco Knights of Benyon. He is a former comrade of Har. He and his squad are trespassing in the skies above Crimea. Upon discovering Leanne, he plans to capture and sell her to make a lot of money. Yardley is a servant of Duke Ludvek of Felire. He has been going around to villages gathering supporters for a rebellion against Queen Lincia using Ike's name. He eventually ends up in Oma where Nephany, Brom, and Heather take up arms to defend themselves. Mirage is a servant of Ludvek. Lucia visits Ludvek in Felire with the goal of finding proof that he is plotting a rebellion. She finds said proof in a nearby cave. That is when Mirage and his troops corner Lucia and try to prevent her escape. Tashoria is another of Ludvek's servants. He is left in charge of defending Castle Felire when Joffrey and the Crimean Royal Knights arrive to arrest Ludvek. Ludvek, however, is leaving to attack Alincia at the capital and actually just left Tashoria to die as a distraction. 
Ludvec is the Duke of Felire in Crimea, Alencia has acknowledged Peleus as the newly crowned king of Dayan and wanted to make peace with Dayan. However, many Crimean people did not like this. Ludvec took advantage of the people's discontents and the absence of Bastion and called for a revolution and seized the throne for himself. He sent many of his soldiers out to villages to convince the townsfolk into joining Ludvec's cause. Eventually, Alencia gets proof of Ludvec's schemes and sends Joffrey and the royal knights to arrest him. Ludvec planned for this and left some of his soldiers behind at Felire to die as a distraction while he led his army to attack Alencia directly at the capital. Also at this time, he had abducted Lucia and cut her hair and sent it to Alencia as a warning. Alencia was then moved to Fort Alpia for her protection. This does not stop Ludvec as he had learned of this and attacks the fortress. Ludvec fails by the efforts of Alencia and her allies and is arrested. Even after his arrest, Ludvec still has one trick up his sleeve, which is that his supporters have gathered outside and threatened to execute Lucia. They ask for Ludvec's release in exchange for Lucia's safety. Alencia refuses, and even though Ludvec's plan was stopped once again, he was still excited to watch Alencia suffer at the loss of her close friend. However, Bastion was one step ahead of everyone as he hired Ike and the Grail mercenaries. Before he left for an investigation in Dayan, the Grail mercenaries were lying in wait and they save Lucia in the last possible moment. Silvano is a Benyon soldier working under General Septimus. He and Septimus are stationed at Fort Flagare near Benyon's border. Ike and the Lagoo's alliance attack the fort and Septimus flees in fear, leaving Silvano to fend for himself. Ramit leads the defense of a fortress town, McGill. His soldiers are tricked into overindulging on food and drink by Mist, Leith, and Lyre. Then at night, Ramit and his men are ambushed by Ike and the Lagoo's alliance. Istvan is the general of Lord Seliora's personal army in Benyon. He fights against the Grail mercenaries and seeks a reward and glory on behalf of his master. Veyona is a Benyon commander in charge of defending Benyon's supply train at the Ribbon River. This is also where several senators are camping. Ike and the Grail mercenaries attack this camp to try and force Zelgius to retreat from the front lines. Callum is a Benyon soldier serving Zelgius. He is stationed at the top of a narrow passageway to the peak of a mountain and is tasked with preventing the Lagoo's alliance from interfering with Zelgius's and Skirmir's duel. Lombroso is a Benyon commander who defied Zelgius's order and with the authorization of a senator led an attack on Castle Seliora where Ike and the Grill mercenaries were staying. He is driven by his hatred of Lagoo's and wanted to see them all killed. Leith is a cat Lagoose from Gallia. She is a proud warrior who once carried a hatred of Bjork, but her travels with Ike have led her to gradually soften this stance. Lyre is her twin sister. Leith is fighting in the Lagoose alliance against Benyon, and currently they are crossing the Ribbon River, retreating from the front lines. Dayan now has entered the war and has sent Micaiah to attack the Lagoose alliance. Micaiah ambushes them at night during the retreat, and Leith is forced to fight when she cannot control her troops as they would rather die than turn their backs like cowards. Kesda is also a Cat Lagoose and a captain in the Lagoose Alliance. If Leith is dead at this point, Kesda will be in her stead, fighting back against Micaiah's ambush. Septimus is a Benyon general and a subordinate of Zelgius. After fleeing from Fort Flagare, he was ordered by Valtome to follow the Lagoose Alliance into the lava filled Kalku Caves and retrieve their charred corpses, as it was believed that they would no doubt die in the caves. They were alive, however, and Ike and Negro mercenaries fought. Septimus off as Skirmir search for an exit into Gallia. Rourke is a Benyon commander. He leads his troops in an invasion of Crimea, who was neutral at the time. Near the border, he has his soldiers pillage a town for funds and provisions for the army. The Crimean royal knights intervene and put a stop to him. Sergei is a Benyon soldier in Senator Valtome's personal army. Valtome enters Crimea with the intent to attack the Lagoose alliance. Alencia stands firm and orders Valtome to leave. Valtome believes that she has no right to order him around, and so he sends Sergei to attack her. The Grail mercenaries and the Crimean royal knights successfully defend Alencia. Gorin is a Dayan commander. He led his forces in defense of Oribis Bridge against an attack from Ike and the Apostles' army. He holds Micaiah in high regard and believes Sonaki is a false apostle. 
Sigrun is the commander of the Benyon Holy Guard and is one of Sonaki's most trusted retainers. In the Mad King's War, she barely ever left the Apostle's side, and late into the war, she negotiated with Har into letting Shiharam's men and families take refuge in Benyon. Then during Benyon's war with the Lugu's alliance, Sonaki was imprisoned by the Senate, but Sigrun and Tanith were able to free her, and then they were able to arrive just in time to stop Faltome from executing Zelgius. As the Apostle Apostle's army is making its way towards Benyon. Micaiah and Dayan's army ambush the Apostle's unit while Ike is away. Sigrun takes command and defends Sonaki with her life. Ike is the son of Grail and Elena. Ike and his sister Mist were born in Gallia, where they all lived happily, until the day that Grail touched Laron's medallion and killed Elena. Ike witnessed the entire event and was traumatized by what he saw. Sephirin and Zelgius were in the area and realized what had happened. Sephirin then sealed Ike's memories away so that he wouldn't have to live on with such a burden. Afterwards, Grail started the Grail mercenaries and moved to Crimea, where they performed odd jobs for villagers. Then then, after Grail's death at the hands of the Black Knight, Ike took command of the Grail mercenaries and was one of the leading figures in Crimea's restoration during the Mad King's War. The new Queen Alincia then granted him a court title and land, however Ike soon renounced his title to return to the life of a mercenary as he disliked politics. Then Ike supported the Lugu's alliance and fought against Benyon up until Sonaki's release from imprisonment, after which he was appointed General of the Apostles' Army. Currently, Micaiah and Dayan's army are occupying Castle Knox in Dayan. They continue to stand in the Apostles' army's way, and so Ike leads an invasion of Knox and hopes to end the battle quickly. Micaiah was born as part of Benyon's imperial family. She is the granddaughter of the Apostle Misaha and is Sonaki's older sister. Micaiah was the one to inherit the family's branded heron blood and the ability to hear the goddess's voice. She was believed to be assassinated alongside Misaha by the senators. How she survived is not explained, but eventually she ended up under the care of an elderly lady in Dayan. The woman raised Micaiah and told her what her brand was and what it meant also telling her to never let anyone see it and to always be on guard. After the woman died, Micaiah traveled throughout Dayan, trying to keep a low profile and to avoid people from taking notice to how slowly she ages and made her living as a fortune teller. As the years passed, Micaiah became aware of the many powers granted to her by her brand, such as reading minds, sensing nearby danger, and her power of sacrifice, in which she heals wounds by transferring them into her own body. Then she encountered a young Soth, in the back alley of Navasa. They became close as they traveled together over the continent. Around the time of the Mad King's War, Micaiah abandoned Soth in Crimea and took a ship to Benyon. Soth then joined Ike's army and after the war, Micaiah and Soth reunited in Dayan. This is also when she met Yune, her bird companion. Soon, the Dawn Brigade was formed and Micaiah went on to help liberate Dayan from Benyon's occupation army, which then led to Peleus signing a blood contract with Senator Lucane, forcing Micaiah and Dayan's army into fighting against the Lagu's alliance and later the Apostles' army, ultimately leading to one final battle in which Micaiah tried to prevent the Apostles' army from advancing through Dayan. During this battle, the chaotic energies of Laron's medallion flared up more than ever before, causing Micaiah to abandon the battle to follow a voice calling her to a small fort where the medallion was. Micaiah sings the Galder of Release and awakens Yune and Asherah from their slumber. Yuma and Catalina are both former members of Benyon who become part of the Disciples of Order. After Asherah awakened, they both call Yune a dark god and wish to purge Yune and her minions. Valtome is the Duke of Colbert and a Benyon senator. He, along with the other senators, desire to seize control of Benyon from Sonaki. He and the other senators provoke the Laguz nations into forming the Laguz alliance and attacking Benyon. With the war underway, the senators then imprisoned Sonaki and Seferin to keep them from interfering. Then later into the war, Valtome took command over Benyon's central army and was dead set on eliminating all Lagoos. Many of his plans are foiled by both Zelgius and Alincia, leading to him arranging Zelgius' execution. This was interrupted by Sonaki, and afterwards the central army was split between those loyal to the Senate and those loyal to Sonaki. Then after Asher's awakening, Valtome leads an army of disciples in a battle against the Hawk army trying to get revenge on Alincia. 
Numida is another Banyan senator. After the Mad King's War, Crimea handed the responsibility of Dayan over to Banyan. Numida was appointed as the occupational governor of Dayan. Numida then placed Jared as general of the occupation army. Under Numida's direction, Jared established labor camps and forced all of Dayan's men to work in them, aiming to break them mentally and physically so that they would never try to fight back. Eventually, Sonaki found out about these abuses, forcing Numida to work with Lacane to form the plan of pinning the blame entirely on Jared in order to save his own skin. Numida then kept a low profile until Asher's awakening, where he led an army of disciples to attack the Silver Army in the Grand Desert. Oliver is a former Benyon senator and was once Duke of Tanis. He is an avid collector of beauty and during the Mad King's War, he purchased Rayson as a slave. This crime was discovered and Oliver was thought to have been executed. However, he was secretly saved by the Senate and was left in hiding in his mansion. He is rediscovered when the Grail army decides to rest in his manor and Hetzel orders him to kill them. Initially, he complied, but upon seeing Raphael, he quickly changed changes sides. Izuka is a Dayan scientist who created the drugs used to create pharaoh ones. He found the orphan Peleus and claimed him to be Ashnard's son and used him as a figurehead for Dayan's liberation. Izuka has secretly been working with the Benyon Senate and tricked Peleus into signing the blood contract. After his coronation, Izuka then disappeared until he sides with Ashura upon her awakening. Hetzel is a Benyon senator and the Duke of Asmin. Days before Misaha's assassination and the Serenus massacre, Hetzel purchased Raphael at a slave auction. Raphael soon fell ill, but Hetzel nursed him back to health and promised to return him to Serenus Forest. Hetzel had no involvement in the events. However, he did admit that he could have done something to prevent it, but didn't. He just stood by and let it happen. Raphael soon fled and somehow ended up in Atari on the verge of death, but was saved by Nyla. Hetzel then quietly follows Elkane's orders, claiming that he had no other choice, all the way up to his final confrontation in the Tower of Guidance. Lacane is the Duke of Gados and the leader of Benyon's corrupt senators. Long has he been plotting to overthrow the apostles and give control over Benyon to the Senate. He is the ringleader behind the assassination of the apostle Misaha and framing the herons for it, which led to the Serenus massacre and fueling the hatred between Laguz and Bjork to burn ever stronger. He then had the young Sonaki installed as the next empress and he knew that she would never be able to hear the goddess's voice and so he spread the lie that the reason for that was that Sonaki had just not come of age yet. He had Benyon's people and Sonaki herself believe this lie for a long time. He had Peleus and Nesala both sign blood contracts and effectively had their countries under the Senate's control. He is also the one behind Sonaki and Seferin's imprisonment during the war which allowed him to seize control over Benyon. Upon Asher's awakening, he basically goes insane calling himself Asher's chosen one. Lavelle joined the Benyon army when he was young and served for several years, rising through the ranks until he became general of Lacane's personal army. He was inspired by Shiharam, Har, and Zelgius. Lavelle then became Zelgius' second-in-command in Benyon's central army, where he respected Zelgius even more and saw him as an even greater role model than before, so much that when the central army split, Lavelle abandoned his service to Lacane and followed Zelgius to side with Seth and Sonaki. Then, in the Tower of Guidance, Zelgius challenges Ike to a duel and orders Lavelle to kill the others if they interfere, except he can't harm Micaiah. Zelgius and the Black Knight are one and the same. Zelgius was born in Dayan and is branded through his father's side. Because of the brand, his family hated him and he grew up alone, unable to trust anyone. Eventually, he joined Dayan's military to escape the abuse, but he soon realized this was not something he could easily escape from as he aged much slower than others, leading him to hide this fact by rarely removing his armor. He knew he could not keep this up forever and would eventually have to leave the 
the army. Zelgius grew accustomed to being alone, but during his stay in the army he served under Gawain and studied swordplay from him and greatly admired him. That was the one thing that Zelgius would miss when the time came. Zelgius is then found by Laron, who offers Zelgius to come with him and neither of them would ever have to be alone again, as Laron has something he must do and would very much like Zelgius' help. From then on, everything he did was almost entirely by Seferin's will. Then Gawain left Dan under the name Grail and formed a mercenary company. Zelgius was crushed, but he vowed to find him again and challenge him to a duel to know if he had surpassed him. Zelgius then became a general in Benyal's army, and during the Mad King's War, he worked as the double agents. He became the Black Knights who conceal his identity and quickly won Ashnard's favor due to his incredible strength. Seferin then ordered the Black Knight to take the medallion from Grail and give it to Ashnar to begin the process of freeing the Dark God. This also gave the Black Knight the chance to have his duel with Grail to decide whether or not he had surpassed his teacher. This duel, however, left much to be desired. As unknown to Zelgius at the time, Grail had severed the tendons in his sword arm, leaving him much weaker than he was in his prime. Also, Zelgius could not obtain the medallion as he heard the roar of Gallia's king in the distance and was forced to warp away. However, throughout the Mad King's War, he saw potential in Grail's son Ike, ultimately leading to their duel at Nato's castle, in which Zelgius let Ike win so that Ike could live and get stronger and live up to his father's legacy. After that battle, the Black Knight was presumed dead, but Zelgius, under his own identity, continued to assist with Benyon's war efforts. Three years later, the Black Knight reappears to save Micaiah and help her win Dan's liberation. Then Zelgius led Benyon's central army in the war with the Laguz Alliance, while also appearing before Micaiah as the Black Knight a couple of times, all the way up to the time that he is almost executed by Valtome, after which he returns to Benyon to free Seferin from his imprisonment. Finally, in the Tower of Guidance is the moment that Zelgius has been waiting so very long for. Ike and Zelgius have their final duel. Zelgius is mortally wounded by Ike, and Ike has lived up to Zelgius' expectations as he truly felt as if he was fighting against Grail in his prime, and that his rivalry with Ike gave his life meaning. As he dies, he thanks Ike and says he will await Seferin in the afterlife. Degincia is the Black Dragon King of Goldoa. He is one of Ashura's three heroes who defeated Yune in the distant past. He has three children, Rajayon, Almeida, and Kurthnaga, and Sorin is his grandson. After Yune was defeated, he, Lairon, and the other two heroes made a promise to Ashura that the people of Tellius would find peace and not fight among each other for 1,000 years. Yune was then sealed in Lairon's medallion, the Fire Emblem. In order to keep this promise, Degincia changed history and spread legends of a dark god inside the medallion to discourage people from warring with each other. This didn't really work. People still fought. They didn't care. Degincia still followed his promise though and kept Goldoa an isolationist nation, rarely interfering with the outside world, going so far as to calling Lagu's slaves necessary sacrifices if they were to make good on their promise to Ashura when speaking to Lairon on the matter. Leading up to the events in the Mad King's War, Degincia Degincia lost two of his children to Ashnar's ambitions. This almost tempted him into burning Dayan to the ground. When Ashura awakens, Degincia fights on her side as he sees it as punishment for all that he has done and for what he allowed to happen. After he is defeated, he asks Yune for forgiveness, which she does. He then appoints Kurthnaga as the new king of Koldoa. Seferin, long ago, was known as Lairon. Lairon is from the Heron clan and was a close companion and advisor to the goddess Ashunera. He was also blessed with the ability to hear her voice, an ability that he would later pass down through his descendants, his descendants being all of Benyon's future apostles, as he got together with Altina and the two had the first branded child. Then the brand would appear in all future apostles. Their abilities allowed them to predict things like in pending disasters and how crops would fare. It continued like this all up until Misaha was assassinated and Sonaki became the next apostle. It was mostly Lairon's idea that Ashunera should split into two halves, Ashura and Yune, though this just led to war between Yune and Ashura's three heroes that ended with Yune's defeat. Lairon did not want to see Yune destroyed, so he suggested another idea to have Yune sealed inside a medallion, and then this led to the promise that Bjork and 
Laguz would live in peace for the next thousand years, and Astra would allow Yune to return to her and once again become Astrunera, but should the people continue to fight, Astra will annihilate them. There was also the condition to wake the goddesses early with the Galder of Release, and Astra also warned that should Yune wake from the chaos of war, then she would also awaken and rain down her punishments. Eventually, Lairon had his child, and he found himself to have lost his power, unable to transform or sing Galder. Fearing how the public would react to this phenomenon, Lairon faked his own death and went into hiding in Goldoa, where he stayed for centuries and watched as Lagoos were enslaved by Bjork and the two races could not stop fighting with each other. After failing to convince the Gintia to do something about it, he set off on his own and visited Misaha in Benyon, where he learned that she was planning to expose herself as a branded in the hopes that this could stop the prejudice and hatred and bring the two races closer together. Lairon, inspired by this new hope, planned to return to Goldoa and spread the good news. Shortly after, Lairon learned that Misaha was assassinated before she got the chance to do so, and the Serenus massacre had occurred as well. This devastation resulted in Lairon deciding that Bjork no longer deserved to live, and Laguz are flawed as well. He was resolved to awaken Ashura early and let her cast her judgments and punish the people for their crimes. However, Lairon lost his powers and could not use the Galder of Release, so he came up with the idea of releasing the goddesses through a continent-spanning war. To do this, he became Seferin and became a Benyon senator. He also took advantage of Ashnard's ambitions and allowed him to learn of a dark god inside the medallion, leading to Ashnard desiring to find the medallion and release the dark god, inciting the Mad King's war. Seferin also recruited Zelgius to his cause as he felt that he could not accomplish his ultimate goal alone. Seferin then didn't have much else to do as the wars broke out and he just observed how things progressed and finally due to the war between the Laguz and Benyon, the Fire Emblem grew more and more unstable and Yune was about to be awakened through the chaos of war. However, Micaiah was able to arrive in time to wake her through the Galder of Release. This didn't matter to Seferin as he was already beside Ashura waiting for her to wake up and when she did, he told her his side of the story that Laguz and Bjork could not resist the urge to fight, prompting Ashura to pass down her judgment, turning almost everyone to stone. Seferin then remained in the upper levels of the Tower of Guidance. He sealed the doorway to Ashura through magic tied to his own life and waited for Ike and the rest to arrive. Ashura is the goddess of order and stability. She is one half of Ashunera, the goddess of dawn, the other half being Yune, the goddess of chaos and emotions. Ashunera created life on Tellius, and her creations eventually evolved to be the Zunama, the ancestors to the Bjork and Laguz. Ashunera loved her creations and bestowed them with more knowledge. This gave rise to a variety of races and tribes across the land. Naturally, each of these races thought their own was superior to the others, and conflict arose between them. Conflict gave rise to hate and anger, and this only caused the conflicts to grow larger in scale. Ashunera tried to stop the fighting. She gave them different names, Laguz and Bjork, but this only made matters worse. The fighting became too much for her to handle. She let her emotions run wild, losing control over her powers, and caused the Great Flood, a terrible disaster that flooded the world, killed countless Bjork and Laguz, and left Tellius as the only remaining landmass. Heartbroken, Ashunera split herself into two separate entities, Ashura and Yune. Yune, still unable to control her emotions, could not be left unchecked. Ashura believed that if she were to become a goddess that could properly guide and protect her people and become perfect, then Yune cannot exist, and so she called upon three heroes to eliminate Yune. These three heroes were Altina, Soan, and Degincia. The three heroes defeated Yune and and convinced Ashura to allow Yune to be imprisoned in a medallion and entrusted to Lairon's care. The three heroes and Lairon did not wish for Yune's erasure, and so they promised to Ashura that Bjork and Laguz would not war for 1,000 years. In this promise, Ashura and Yune would enter a deep slumber. Then upon their reawakening, if Bjork and Laguz continue to war with each other, Ashura will cast down her judgment upon them and turn them to stone or erase them from the world. 
world as punishment for their sins. If they awake to a world of peace and order, Ashura will reward her people and allow Yune to return to her and become Ashinera once again. There was one more condition that should Yune and Ashura be awakened early through the Galder of Release, they will listen to the people's plight and then consult with each other and judge their people fairly and impartially, but Yune could also be awakened early from the chaos of war and should that happen, Ashura will awaken as well and punish the people by erasing them from the world. Ashura entered her sleep at the top of the Tower of Guidance in Benyon and was worshipped as a kind and loving goddess by the people of Benyon and other lands. Ultimately, Ashura and Yune were awakened early through the Galder of Release, however Ashura did not consult with Yune and only listened to what Laron had to say and decided that the best course of action was to turn everyone to stone. Ashura released the major senators and many of Benyon's soldiers and formed her disciples of order and told them to eliminate Yune's armies. Her disciples failed and Ike and the rest finally confront Ashura and Ike uses Yune's power to strike her down. And with all that said, this is the end of the video. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, like, comment, subscribe, and have a great rest of your day.